This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash quim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 288, recorded on May 11th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. You have good weather there? It is gorgeous. We had a big storm come in Tuesday night, and it blew the dickens out of everything. But uh, it's been very pleasant, low humidity, and in the beautiful 70-degree range. Fahrenheit, of course, not Celsius. We may get the 70 degrees Celsius in a few we, few years. We are warmer than you are. We are 26 Celsius, 80-something degrees. How about that? Yeah. Unusual, because yesterday was chilly. It's crazy weather. Also joining us from St. Louis, Missouri, Petra Levin. Hi. It's good to be here. We have, I would say, high 70s, low 80s, and rain on and off. It keeps threatening to rain for the past five days. We haven't gotten much. And then today, we got a brief downpour. So I'm hopeful because the plants still need it to start growing. And from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, where it's a beautiful, sunny and 77 degrees. Nice. Yeah, which is not as impressive as the two papers that you all picked out. They are awesome. This is really an exciting day we have. (laughs) Yeah, they are. They're very cool. I'm going to start off with a snippet. You know, the the thing, the snippet in paper was a thing that Alio came up with. He said, why don't we do a snippet before the main paper so we can do more? But the, the idea was originally 10 to 15 minutes, but uh, it has, we have, you know. Digressed. Digressed, but it's fine. Longer. Uh, so we'll still call it a snippet. This was suggested by listener Paolo, who said, can you please discuss this nature paper. And I took a look at it and uh, it has to do with cancer. And I thought this would be uh, interesting. We, we haven't talked about cancer for a while, right? Uh, no. Long time, if ever. I don't even remember. This is a nature article, mutational signature in colorectal cancer caused by genotoxic PKS plus E. coli. And I have to say that uh, my, I lost both of my parents to colorectal cancer. Uh, wow. And so I have to be extremely vigilant. My dad at 60, my mother at 72. Ouch. And um, so I have a, I have a col- colonoscopy every week. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> it just alone. feels that way. <laughs> I'm kidding. I think that would, that would be a good, sta- that would be my only stand-up joke if I were doing comedy. <laughs> I would get up there yes. right? and people would laugh at it because all three, all three of you did. No, I had like four to five years. Well, and that's because we're all old enough to have undergone a colonoscopy. I've done and like five. Prep. It's just the prep. Five. The prep is the it's worst. The yeah, prep. It's horrible. Uh, anyway, this uh, is a paper out of a large consortium from all over the world, the Netherlands, uh, Massachusetts, uh, California, and many other places. The first three authors are Caetano Pleguelos, Pleguizelos Manzano. I'm very sorry. Caetano, Jens Pushoff, and Alex Rosendahl Huber. Last author is Hans Cleavers. So this is all about bacteria and uh, E. coli, and it's been it's been suggested for years that bacteria, especially our, our intestinal microbiome, right? This is colorectal cancer could play a role in colorectal cancer, and uh, people who have uh, colorectal cancer have are enriched in certain kinds of uh, bacteria, including. The subject of this paper, genotoxic strains of E. coli. And these uh, E. coli make a genotoxin called colibactin. Genotoxin meaning it does bad things to your DNA, which we will talk about. Like 20% of healthy individuals have E. coli that produce this uh, genotoxin. It's called PKS for um, polyketide non-ribosomal peptide synthase operon. These are peptides that are made on an enzyme, not on a ribosome. Very interesting. 
And 40% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease have these E. coli, and 60% with uh, familial adenotomas, aden, adenotomas, how do you say it? Adenomatous. Adenomas? That's it. Adenomatous. Adenomatous polyposis or colorectal cancer. Uh, this protein, this genotoxin, uh, does a variety of things to your DNA, including inducing double-stranded breaks. Uh, in mice, it can, they can cause tumor formation. Uh, and um, uh, recently been found that uh, the, the, the protein, the uh, genotoxin, attaches to uh, adenine in, uh, in DNA. So the chemistry of all this is known, but what the outcome is isn't uh, clear. Now, before we get into it, we have to explain what a mutational signature is. You have a disease, you look in the genome and you ask, are there any specific patterns of uh, DNA changes that we see that are associated uh, with uh, the particular disease? Uh, and we know lots of mutational signatures like, uh, you know, a base substitution between a certain, certain other bases or deletions and insertions in specific uh, sequence areas. We know in some cases what causes them, like uh, tobacco or UV light. Uh, um, but what, what causes them, we don't often know. Uh, and there's where comes in one of the uh, reagents used in this paper, in intestinal organoids, which are cell cultures made from stem cells that resemble in some, in some ways uh, the intestine. You know, they're made from crypt cells and, uh, they, you know, they don't have immune systems. They don't have a lot of things, but they're anatomically similar to the, to the crypts. And so we use those to uh, say we expose them to a mutational agent. We can then sequence the genome and say what kind of mutational signature is tobacco smoke or the condensate of tobacco smoke uh, doing. So that's what they used here. They want to know what's the mutational signature of this PKS plus E. coli. So they take on the organoid cell on the organized itself. So they have uh, they have a E. coli PKS plus strain, which was derived from a, a colorectal cancer biopsy, and then they have uh, human organoid cultures, uh, and they inject these are these are uh, they have a lumen, right? So they're they're round and they have a lumen, and you inject the E. coli inside. You know the lumen is kind of approximating the uh, the gut lumen, except. It's not a tube; it's a it's a sphere, uh, and then you can uh, ha you can see the effect of the E. coli, and you can have a control where the E. coli lacks the the colobactin, so you can have a proper control, and then you can do uh, uh, genome sequencing and figure figure out the signature. And th so they do this; uh, they put the E. coli in there for a long period of time, five months, and then they they do genome sequencing and they compare the coli with and without the uh, the genotoxin. And just to be clear, this is the human genome that they're sequencing. This is the human genome. What is yeah, the impact of the bacterium on the human, human right, not intestinal the cells? Right. Yep. So they define a, a single base substitution signature that they don't see in uh, organoids exposed to the, to the mutant E. coli. Uh, and um, they also see a small uh, in, indel uh, insertion deletion signature as well. And they see, they see a few other patterns as well. So basically, they can identify mutational signatures caused by uh, these E. coli. And they're different from all other known uh, mutational signatures, right? Okay, so you have an organoid, you put this E. coli in it, you get mutations. So what, right? <laughs> what about people? <laughs> so they, what do you do here? Uh, well, it turns out that could, there are could, before you go on, what was really impressive is they treated the initial organoid, and then they took that organoid and they subcloned it, and they made another mm -hmm. set of progeny. Right. So they ended up essentially cloning, so they could ask if there were different events, different mutational events that happened in the after the initial Correct. exposure. This is really a tour de force, technically. It seems. Yeah, it's it's very nice. All right, so uh, we have a lot of sequences from tumors, tumor mm -hmm. databases. And the first one they looked at is a uh, whole genome sequence database from a Dutch collection of 3,668 solid cancer metastases. Uh, and so they just say, do these mutational signatures that we observe 
in our organoids with this E. coli, do we find any of those signatures in the genome? And they, they do, of course, otherwise this wouldn't be a nature paper, right? <laughs> <laughs> if it were negative, that would be some other journal and, and it would be a problem. But negative data are good as well. And anyway, they do find two of the uh, signatures, the PKS, so that's the, uh, the, the coli uh, gene there. The PKS signatures were enriched in these databases. Seven and a half percent of colorectal cancer samples had this signature, the single base substitution signature. And if you want to know what it is, it's a, ch- it's a base change with uh, specific uh, bases around it. So, for example, uh, it's a T to N, T to something else. And it can be surrounded with two A's, an A or a T, or a T and a T. Okay, so that's a signature. And they find it in over in 7.5% of the colorectal cancers. Uh, then they have this indel, the insertion deletion signature. That's in 8.8%. So overall, six and a quarter percent of those cancers have a signature of this, this, this mutational signature defined by this E. coli protein. It's quite a, it's quite a bit. And the other thing you should mention is indels typically have a specific location Mm. that they're found in in the host. And that could be suggestive of how the colobactin is having this activity on the host genome because the the colobactin is likely having that same effect in the bacterium. Right. And Vincent will get into the mechanism as we go forward. So these indels are single T deletions in T homopolymers. In other words, stretches of T's, T, 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 T. You get single T deletions in there. Uh, okay, so that's that. And then, they, of course, they look in other genomes. They have the Genomics England 100,000 Genomes Project. It has data from 2,208 colorectal cancer tumors, uh, five so the single base change in the indels were found in 5% and 4.4% of patients. So um, that's quite interesting that the same signature is found in tumors. So that means it's likely relevant. And sequencing tumors is not an unusual research-only activity. Now, many cancer patients are having their tumors sequenced or mm-hmm. genotyped to specifically find out which chemotherapeutics would work best on them, but at the same time, they are isolating the total tumor DNA, which then opens up an opportunity to get to mechanism and to begin to think about how this is happening. Right. So if you're having a tumor removed and the doctor asks you, can we take it? Can you sign a consent uh, to take it? And see, you should say, yes, it's going to, it's going to go in one of these studies that we'll talk about, you know, um, it's good. It's good for science. I'm wondering if they could develop a vaccine against the toxin. Well, that's a good question because they mentioned at the end, um, they say detection and removal of PKS plus E. coli. Right. Right. And uh, and we should not give people probiotics that have this island, this PKS no. island, which apparently <laughs> happens. Right. It's not good. So next time you buy, P- you know, probiotics from Amazon, make sure it doesn't have PKS in it. So, yeah, how do you do Michelle, that? have you been reading this morning's New York Times discussing the pancreatic cancer mRNA vaccine? Perhaps. Yeah. Very this exciting. W- this Quite would be. Yeah. This would be much simpler technology because you're going after the bacterium rather than sequencing the tumor. You're going simply after one gene right. product, the colobactin, as opposed to having to sequence everyone's yep. tumor. So how would a ma- vaccine against this work? Uh, you're going to vaccinate against would, the protein, right? And you would want it expressed in the mucosal. So it have to be a mucosal the, vaccine, right? It would have to be a mucosal vaccine, and it would have to almost be a continuously expressing a barren protein <laughs> that would continuously stimulate the so pyrus patch. That, so that's the that's question I have. This PKS, <laughs> this, this PKS protein, it must get out of E. coli in order to, oh, yeah. to be genotoxic. Well, is it normally is, secreted? I think yeah. it, it might just be dead E. coli. 
that E. coli. Because, I mean, these these ketides are made, polyketides are made in the cell. My other question, though, is E. coli, despite it being easy to isolate, is just a tiny fraction. I just, it's 0.1% of all the microbes in your gut. And I don't know where it is in dysbiosis, like if you shift it. But, and then these are a tiny fraction of that. So my question is, sure, if you're going to inject it into an organoid where it's essentially a monoculture, but I feel like we're, you know, this is correlative data between yeah. patient data yeah, sure. and this organoid experiment, which is really interesting, but maybe it's, it could be the protein, but it could be the product. And if it's the mm-hmm. product, then we need to be thinking larger about that. And I would be really interested to know if, and I'm sure this data is somewhere out there with, because obviously if people who are genetically predisposed to these colorectal cancers, which are one set, and then you have the ones that uh, just occur spontaneously. But I mean, I feel like there's a lot missing between this and making a vaccine. And again, the correlation causation is one of those, yeah. that connection sure. is missing. No, no, sure. I mean, it's this very is interesting, many- but I mean, ketides, polyketides are... You know, even actinomycetes make, I mean, these are made by a lot of work sure. things. So, I mean, the thing is using a vaccine to test it is is iffy because you don't know if the vaccine works to begin with. Right. That's right. The and then you also don't know whether you're targeting the right bacteria. Because again, I don't know exactly. whether E. coli, I mean, normally when I've seen dysbiosis studies, I don't maybe want somebody knows more than me, but I don't think E. coli really expands that much. I think it's other organisms. Yeah, so. sure. And I dropped into the show notes um, a paper that came out in 2022 in September entitled The Microbiome Product Colobactin Hits Unique Cellular Targets Mediating Host Microbes Interaction. And it's a review article that's in Frontiers in Pharmacology. And so that's freely, Mm -hmm. it's an open access paper. So if you're curious about it, you can go and find out more about it. And Vincent's also put a another paper on this topic in uh, the show notes from PNAS as well. So and a couple of other things they did. Uh, so tumors have what we call driver mutations. When you sequence a tumor, you, you find common mutations that are, are thought to be essential for establishment of the tumor. There are typically about a dozen or so that are needed. So when a cell, when a cell becomes transformed, transformation means it continues to grow uh, and it's and it has a number of different growth properties and the problem with continuing to grow is that every every growth cycle every cell division these are human cells now the genome is mutated because dna replication is uh, has errors associated with it and eventually just randomly you will accumulate enough of those 12 mutations to cause uh, a, a cancer to arise and that's why dividing forever is not good. Most of our cells don't divide because dividing is a bad thing. And so anyway, so the, these these driver mutations, they wanted to know if any of the signature mutations of PKS uh, include these drivers. And so they looked at patients with colorectal cancer and uh, um, they found 112 out of 4,700 driver mutations in colorectal cancer uh, matched their colobactin target uh, motif. And the most mutated gene, APC, uh, in colorectal cancer has the highest number of changes that match uh, the the single base for the indel PKS target sites. So that's also adding to evidence that this may be um, functional. And identifying potential therapeutic targets, which is really exciting. These uh, changes also occur in, in uh, healthy people without colon cancer. And so there are uh, genome sequences of healthy colon, and they can find some of their um, mutational signatures in those. And so they say maybe these are caused by uh, this E. coli as well. And that, that wouldn't be surprising because then these changes are not always going to lead to cancer, right? If, if, in fact, they're leading to cancer at all. But uh, they, they would be found in uh, normal tissue. And they also find them in a head and neck derived tumor and three urinary tract derived tumors. And they say, um, E. coli, this E. coli has been recovered from such tissues. I don't know what it's doing there, but it's been recovered there. So maybe that has caused these mutations. One 
observation that puzzled me is that 60% of patients with hereditary colorectal cancer right. have this E. coli. So that suggests to me that um, it, there might be, this might be part of like the two hit hypothesis that, that yeah. genetically you've got some vulnerability. And then For if sure, you also sure. have the toxin um, producing E. coli, then you're more apt exactly. to get cancer. Yeah. yeah, you can inherit. So let's say you need 12 mutations to make a cancer. You right. Can inherit one or six or 10 from your parents. And then all you need are to fill in the, you know, just in a simplistic Fill in the <laughs> blank. Uh, or you can, and you can inherit none, in which case maybe you'd never develop, or you can inherit a lot, in which case you might develop a childhood cancer. So yeah, it's going to vary from person. So if your parents, well, anyway, yeah. that's the idea. So how did this, how does this work? Um, they didn't do any uh, experiments here, but uh, we know that uh, this protein colobactin makes crosslinks between A's on two different DNA strands. And they say, you know, they, they see A changes three to four bases apart, which, which is consistent with an idea that uh, this, this protein is cross-linking and then the two strands at A's and then it's resolved in some way. So if DNA is cross-linked in your nucleus, it needs to be fixed. Your, your cell doesn't like that. Any damaged DNA gets repaired in some way. And sometimes the repair makes, makes the problem, right? If it's not broke, don't fix it, but even if it's broken and you fix it, you can still cause a problem. So you try and resolve these cross-linked A's. You can cause double-strand breaks, uh, and that can lead to mutagenesis. You can try to excise the bases, and that can also lead to mutations as well. As well. So um, a cross-linking by this protein could lead to uh, these, these kinds of signatures. So obviously more work to be done here. But anyway, this, that's the story here, that, this, uh, that when they expose organoids for five months to this protein, this E. coli protein, you get a u unique uh, mutational signature that you also find in, in human tumors. Uh, and um, it's even in a healthy colon as well. So as I said, they end up saying detection and removal of PKS plus E. coli it may, be, uh, may decrease risk. I don't, I don't know how you... Do you, do you, Michael, you suggested a vaccine. Could you remove specifically PKS plus E. coli from the from the gut? Is there a way to do that? Uh, if it's got the right signature on the surface, potentially. Yeah. But I think we have to ask the fundamental question: What's the selective advantage to the host microbiome to maintain uh, E. coli with colobactin in it? What does it do? And doing some reading, I was intrigued by this since I looked at some reading and some papers suggest that colobactin's advantage to E. coli is it induces mutations within E. coli to effectively cause lysogens to come out. And so it may be a way of deburdening E. coli's genome of all the associated phage lysogens. Yeah. It's accumulated over time and it may be a way of weeding its genome. It may be the, the pesticide concept. You know, pesticides are great until they leach into the water supply because they keep the bugs from eating our plants. But when they hit our water supply, it's bad. And so this may be an instance where the colobactin does its thing in E. coli and then it dies and it leaches the colobactin out that then does the bad acting on the uh, intestinal crypt cells. So the, the more number, to be done. The numbers we, we mentioned at the beginning. So 20% of healthy individuals have this E. coli. It goes up to 40% if you have inflammatory bowel disease and then 60% if you have colorectal cancer. So I don't know what that means, but one interpretation is there are different amounts of this E. coli. Um, no, that doesn't make sense. So what? 60% of patients... I guess it's an enrichment because if it causes the cancer, then you're going to see it in a lot of the cancer patients, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's in 20% of, of healthy people. It implies that a family passes, the family not only passes the um, mutations, but also their microbiome. Which faithfully. is true, but I don't know if it's maintained though. Like obviously if you're living in a house with people, but right. You know, if you haven't been living with your parents for decades, does it maintain? Yep. 
That's Does it hang around? Me. I mean, and then my other question is like, I think this is, we need to know more basically. Like they need to mm-hmm. essentially when they, I mean, I guess sampling during a colonoscopy is not a great idea because you've already had the prep, but somehow, you know, some study where you sample before the colonoscopy on large numbers of people, and then you can track, I think, before the cancer is even identified, because I don't know what it means. And you don't know whether the dysbiosis is the, you know, once you have IBS, for example, is that causing, you know, what comes first, what comes second. And again, the way they did the study, which is a totally reasonable way to start, is obviously not very representative of what's going on in a microbiome at all. So, And we could also fall down the rabbit hole of how clean is the scope that they used because the scopes they put up us are not sterile. They are just clean. And remember, there's been a lot of studies out there that show the transference of KPC between colonoscopy patients in hospitals. And the FDA has taken as an action to really clean up the colonoscopy scope cleaning business. (laughs) I don't want to know this. (laughs) It's um, the only reason I know of it is I I work in this space and, you know, (laughs) being able to detect microbes and being able to detect DNA, it's, it's really pretty because this is all based on DNA sequencing. They're not actually growing the E. coli. With well, the well, well I'll, I'll challenge that a bit. I mean, they did some really nice work with um, collections of solid cancer tissue. Oh, no. And found I'm not it. disputing it. I, mean, I, I think you'd have to right. sample. You just have to get a standard microbiome sample before the prep on a lot of yes. people. And then look and see if what the, you know, what the microbes look like in there. You could even do metagenomics to see if this gene is in other microbes because we're already nailing it down to E. coli, but that seems kind of unfair given that there isn't that much E. coli in there. The first time I had a colonoscopy, I walked past the kitchen where they were washing the the scopes, you know, and uh, Mm -hmm. there's just a bunch of people standing at sinks with scrub brushes, you know, just scrubbing the heads with, with the camera on them. And I'm Oh my gosh, they're not going to autoclave. Well, they can't. They're going to, they would ruin them if they autoclave them, right? That's right. We need to make a little capsule, a sterile capsule with a camera in it that you swallow. And then over the next few days, it takes pictures and it passes through. <laughs> and we are back to one there of my favorite movie. movies, Inner Space, or the uh, Magic <laughs> School Bus that does a similar thing. Both. Very yeah, that's good. right. Very good. Or the Fantastic exactly. Journey with Raquel fantastic Welch. Journey. <laughs> There was a, a ride at Disney World where you get injected into a blood vessel and uh, uh-huh. you you go repair something and you bump into cells. It made me so sick because the, the thing is always moving. <laughs> I can't handle that motion. I couldn't wait to get out. I ran out. Oh, my God. It was horrible, horrible ride. Anyway, thank you, Paolo, for uh, suggesting. Interesting paper. All right, Michael. What's up? All right. So we're going to uh, go into a galaxy far, far away, we're going to go back in time about 250,000 years. And the title of today's paper that appeared in last week's Science, Natural Products from Reconstructed Bacterial Genomes of the Middle and Upper Paleolithic. Now, there were 23 authors on the paper, uh, and it's an international paper there. uh, Most of the laboratories were in Germany, uh, a couple were in Spain, then there were a few from New Mexico and the United States, as well as Harvard. And there are three first authors, Martin Clapper, Alexander Eubner, and Anan Ibrahim. And the senior author is Pierre Stallforth. And, and actually, Christina Warner's lab also is another senior author. So this is a collaboration. Okay, it is indeed. And uh, so as you can tell from the title, We're going to be talking about ancient DNA, specifically bacterial DNA recovered from the middle and upper Paleolithic eras. And so we're really talking old, considering that the (laughs) middle Paleolithic, which was noteworthy for its use of flake tools. For those of us who grew up with Fred and Wilma Flintstone, it's the use of a stone tool used during the Stone Age. And there was also, at that period of human existence, widespread use of fire. And this era lasted from about um, 30,000 years ago to about 250,000 years ago. 
The Upper Paleolithic, which saw the emergence of more sophisticated tools, those things with blades and and improvements to the materials that were used, lasted between 50,000 and 10,000 years ago. And some of the DNA used in this paper is literally ancient. Now, the recovery and the manipulation of ancient DNA is not new. We, of course, have the 1990 book by Michael Crichton and then the movie that subsequently followed, directed by uh, Steven Spielberg, Jurassic Park. And what I remember from that movie was the little cartoon, Mr. DNA. And Mr. DNA, I dropped into the show notes, and it really will give our non-molecular familiar audience a, a deep dive into how this sort of thing is actually being done in a modern sense. We're not using amber. We're actually going to use a different biological material, but it's as old, if not older, than the amber. And I also dropped into the show notes a Science Friday piece that really talks about the pioneer of this field, George Punar, um, who actually gave Crichton, you know, his research inspired Crichton. Uh, and that's how Jurassic Park, the, the book came in to be. And as well, when I suggested this paper to our twin team, Petra offered about the mammoth burger. And this is actually a mammoth meatball produced by a company out of Australia. And you heard that right. This is the elephant like creature that went extinct many years ago, and this Australia company is making cultured meat, and the company is Vow. And then there were two other papers that Petra mentioned that I I fondly remember. Petra was a graduate student. Um, I'm a little bit older, so I remember it from actually discovering it. And that's revival and identification of bacterial spores in a 25 to 40 million year old Dominican amber segment. And that was published in science in the mid nineties. And then there's a halophile, but over the last 10 years, we have moved from the realm of science fiction to science fact. And we have witnessed major advances in the field of ancient DNA, where we can now begin to characterize these past paleogenomic uh, pieces of DNA, both in diversity and silico. And today's paper is going to show us we can do it in vivo. But like Elio often cautioned me when we dipped our toe into those early days into the microbiome bioinformatics, much of the data is similar in scope to the old New York City telephone directory, which was about six inches in height. And while the New York City phone book was pretty impressive in its scale, the information within that multi-volume listing was simply a listing. It couldn't offer us any insight into the diversity, the function, the biosynthetic capabilities of those individuals in the phone book. And the same can be said of these paleo genomes until now. And that's what that paper is going to help us appreciate. They, they are actually going to characterize and help us appreciate that this ancient information we may be able to exploit as we move forward in our our attempt to find new drugs, new chemical means of synthesis, or just to gain insight into evolution. So enter today's paper, where the authors investigated the dental calculus of 12 Neanderthals and 52 anatomically modern humans spanning from the present time period all the way back 100,000 years. And from that information, they reconstructed 459 bacterial metagenome-assembled genomes, or as they abbreviated, MAGs. So a digression, what is dental calculus? As I tell my dental students, dental calculus is calcified dental plaque which microbiologists simply call biofilms that constantly form on our teeth. And the bacteria and plaque produce acids after you eat or drink, and they do a mineralization shuffle of our hydroxyapatite that we know as teeth. And 
plaque is nothing more than calcium phosphate mineral salts that are deposited between and within the limp remnants of these formerly viable microbes as biofilms. And if this is will, this is why we're told to floss our teeth. Oh, yes. <laughs> if you will, when your dentist tells you you have or are developing calculus, she or he is offering that you are making fossils from which your children's children will be able to mine data to figure out who or what was in your mouth <laughs> since they were microbes and the microbes that these paleobiologists uncovered in the wild, it's a relative of a green sulfur bacterium, chlorobium, which is one of the players many of us have visualized in that high school biology lab's Vinogratzi column, which for many of us was our first introduction to microbiology. Now, to those listeners who aren't familiar with the Vinogratzi column, it's simply a glass cylinder that's filled with generally pond water and mud. And it was invented in the 1880s by Sergei Winogrodsky. And what you do is you put the pond water and the mud in, then you add some eggshells, some calcium carbonate, you get a sulfur source like gypsum, which is ground up drywall dust, calcium sulfate, or you can even use things out of your refrigerator like egg yolk. You then put that clear glass cylinder in your window for months and the sunlight and the consortia out of the mud will develop an anaerobic aerobic gradient as well as a sulfur gradient. And these two gradients promote the growth of different microorganisms. That's what we saw. But the chlorobium, this green sulfur bacterium is a major player in Winogrodsky columns. Not only did the authors uncover an unusual microbe, But when they began to deconvolute and analyze their data, they identified a biosynthetic gene cluster that was common to seven individuals that lived in the Middle and Paleolithic eras. And when they subjected that ancient DNA to heterologous gene expression in a contemporary-based microbial expression system, they observed the production of a class of previously unknown metabolites that they named paleofurans. Now, if you're like me, I needed a reach for my Morrison and Boyd. That's really aging me because that was my organic chemistry text. And to recall that a furan is a heterocyclic organic compound that consists of five aromatic rings that contain four carbon atoms and one oxygen, and they are often used in the building. And to use one of Alan Dove's famous phrases, complex chicken wire chemistry that are often metabolically remarkable molecules. Bottom lining this for us, the authors offered that this paleobiotechnological approach demonstrates that viable biosynthetic machinery can be produced in 2023 from the preserved genetic materials of ancient microbes, allowing access to natural products from the Pleistocene era, offering us now an opportunity for natural product exploration. So they built us a time machine, albeit one way. We could only go back in time to see what was going on. And and Michael- We can't go forward. Can I just jump in that they- Please. Were able to um, figure this out despite the fact that they had to pool more than somewhere between three and 300 million pieces of DNA that were on average only 30 base pairs in length and to try to remarkable. reconstruct then the whole genome. And mm-hmm. so just to, to imagine that, um, let's say you've got a jigsaw puzzle and each piece is um, you know five inches across. You can build that puzzle very quickly and see what it's telling you. But now let's make each jigsaw puzzle only, you know, a centimeter across. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) That would be the the equivalent. And one of the um, authors, Alex Hubner, is that has been his um, expertise that he's been developing is the um, tools to allow us to assemble whole genomes with confidence from these 
tiny bits of old, old DNA. So yes, they're preserved, but they're not preserved in long, <laughs> long pieces. No, they no, are no. just bits. So this is amazing that they've been able this to do is, this. This is truly remarkable. Now, we're assembling entire bacterial genomes. Vincent and Jeff Tonnenberger had a long discussion of just assembling the flu virus uh, back on TWIV 966. And I'll drop that reference into the show notes. So if you want to listen about assembling and the struggles of assembling something as simple and not that old, it was from 19, you know, 18. Uh, Vincent had that discussion with Dr. Tabenberger at from, from the NIH back in uh, December. But seriously, what this paper offers us is a roadmap, albeit with multiple steps or waypoints along the way. And it's that one thing I'd like to stress is the great lengths that this group of authors went to to demonstrate what they were observing was indeed valid or simply answering the question, was the schmutz that they recovered <laughs> really from fossilized teeth? of the ancient skeletons, was it really associated with their teeth? Now, here, the multiple steps implemented through their workflow address the known challenges of the ancient DNA re recovery. And Michelle really highlighted they were working with 30 MERS rather than megabases, and they had to get to megabases. And, you know, all of this begins back with the development of these assembly algorithms have, that have made next generation sequencing very commonplace in many of our laboratories today. And it's really as a consequence of the advances in bioinformatics. And as the bioinformatics folks teach us, they compare what's old with what's new by sequence analysis and recent de novo assembly of authentic ancient DNA that they abbreviate ADNA, has shown us the, recons the reconstruction of these ancient metagenomic assembled genomes is now possible. And they do it from the fact that there are known mutations that occur as a consequence of the DNA aging. The sequences effectively are changing because of simply time. And they're looking for those uh, mistakes, and they're, they occur at a routine frequency. And as I said earlier, they used the dental calculus from metagenomic databases previously published. And they then again got this de novo assembly. And I already gave away the headline of what they found, the chlorobium, but they got us to a point where they were able to reconstruct 50% of that bacterium's genome. And, and just, just to um, emphasize, Michael, your point about um, making sure, like the validity of, of what they were looking at. We talked in the last paper about the risk of contamination, the handler's DNA contaminating the samples, et cetera. Um, the the um, author, Alex Hubner, and his colleagues developed a tool called Pi Damage that can look mm -hmm. in these large data sets. And if they don't see the characteristic signatures of age-related mm -hmm. DNA damage, they right. know that's likely a contaminant. So they were made sure that before they added any of the DNA reads into their metagenome set, that it um, in fact had signatures of being old. So that takes us to the next bit. They're pretty sure that this is all DNA. They've verified that. But chlorobium is not a genus typical of the oral microbiota, or for that matter, found typically in burial sediments, but was detected in the dental calculus of nine individuals. So you might be then invoking an old philosophical conundrum that is often invoked by our col TWIV colleague, Dan Griffin, mm. when he offers Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is often correct, which here offers that the skeleton or the head somehow got contaminated with the chlorobium. But in the same breath, Daniel always invokes Dr. John Hickam, who is a 
physician first at Duke and then at IU who had a similar dictum, which was a man can have as many diseases as he damn well pleases. <laughs> so could a woman, you know. <laughs> that That's true. But, you know, this was 1970 when Hickam unfortunately passed early in his 50s. Um, so the question is, um, was the did the chlorobium fall in post-mortem or whether Hickam's notion that ancient humans had green photosynthetic bacteria growing in their mouths? So what they then did is they inspected the damage patterns of the chlorobium, high quality metagenomic assembled sequences, and they compared it to a normal oral flora bacterium, Flex Linnea, and from a, an ancient lineage that we know is indeed in the mouth even today. If you will, it's sort of a baked in internal control. And the same pi error machine that or pi error algorithm that they had developed they invoked on the uh, other bacterium the flex linnea and they found out that the chlorobium and the flex linnea exhibit equivalently high frequencies of this five prime c to c to t miscoding characteristic of age-related dna damage so this confirmed that chlor- the chlorobium was indeed in our ancient ancestors' oral cavity. Hmm. Now, the paleoecology and evolution of ancient chlorobium species was then raised. Maybe it wasn't photosynthetic back then. So they then determined the ecological origin of the ancient chlorobium by constructing a phylogenetic tree using all available genomes of this microbe in the database uh, in the order Chlorobaliae's from diverse environmental surfaces. And here again, the CSI detective work gets real cool. The ancient chlorobium were most closely related to chlorobium limicola and were from a previously undescribed monophyletic clade. And yes, they were phototrophic, lithotrophic microbes, which means they're able to convert inorganic substances like hydrogen sulfide and CO2 into organic material, deriving all of the squiggle energy or energy from photosynthesis. And the set of functional genes that came out of their analysis uh, illustrated that they did indeed have photosynthetic genes. But to me, the microbiologist that gave me some comfort, a biofilm forming microbe was there in the mouth because chlorobia uh, limicola is a, naturally occurs in freshwater biofilms. So it's not unusual. You can imagine ancient humans drinking water from streams and picking up this bacterium and it gets somehow trapped in the dental calculus because you know, 250,000 years ago, I don't think they had a dental appointment every six months. And again, what really surprised me most, though, was this statement in the uh, paper. Periodic in vivo host-mediated biofilm calcification or chlorobium-mediated light-dependent dolomite, which is fossilization or calculus formation, may have further facilitated the long-term preservation of this microbe when the dental calculus. So it could be something as simple as they drank contaminated water, they, they weren't brushing after every meal and flossing, and the consequence is it got trapped in the calculus. I was awestruck by that insight. Making a cave in our mouths just prior to or immediately after death. So they convinced me that the ancient humans had fossil-making Winogratsky microbes associated with our ancestors' teeth just prior to or after death. But this next experiment is why we're here. And it's entitled Discovery of Ancient Butyrolactone Biosynthetic Gene Clusters with a Highly Similar Genetic Architecture. And here they screened the genome of this ancient chlorobium 
for biosynthetic gene clusters using another bioinformatic algorithm, AntiSmash. And I dropped into the show notes a review of what AntiSmash does to mm-hmm. explore <laughs> bacteria as reservoirs of novel antimicrobial lipopeptides. And what they found was four bi- different biosynthetic gene clusters, of which a putative butyrolactone terpene biosynthetic gene cluster were the most prevalent. So again, back to Morrison and Boyd. What are butyrolactones? Well, these are structural subunits found in a wide variety of natural products with diverse biological properties. And I'll bet anyone who has ever been to a nail salon has smelled them as a gamma butylactone, which is a, the chemical cleaning solutions, as well as being a nail polish. And in our bodies, GBL is converted to gamma hydroxybutyrate, which can turn off some function of our nervous system. And, you know, unfortunately, it's often known as a date rate drug and, and keeping with our CSI tour. But again, these authors then went the next step to ensure that the butyrolactone biosynthetic gene clusters are of ancient origin. They confirmed that all the respective contigs encoded have characteristic age-related DNA damage, again, using the pi damage algorithm. And then they took these DNA sequences and they looked to contemporary pathways and they asked by performing a metabolic network analysis suggesting that these pathways were indeed real. So there's another reason that we poor graduate students had to learn all those pathways all those years ago. Further analysis through the reconstruction of these ancient biosynthetic gene clusters delivered previously unobserved metabolites, and they found three core genes from them, and they simply then cloned them into two different contemporary expression systems under strong promoters. They made the products. They then characterized the products with sophisticated chemical biochemical tools, HPLC and NMR, and they confirmed that the heterologous expression was indeed from the genes of the ancient cluster by using a fancy chassis-independent recombinase-assisted genome engineering system called CRAGE. And they were stably integrating the ancient biosynthetic genes chromosomally into an engineered pseudomonas proteogens, and additionally into a photorhabdis cani subspecies to verify that the compounds that were dropped into the chromosome were actually indeed from the ancient bug and not an artifact of the two hosts. So they're using two contemporary expression systems from very different microbes, if you will. And the ancient genes, which are conserved in the modern chlorobium, encode biosynthetic enzymes required for production of, now wait for it, bacterial chlorophyll precursors, suggesting that the paleofurans could be involved in regulating bacterial photosynthesis. So in summing up, we go from ancient DNA recovered from the fossils in our mouths. Mm -hmm. We make an entire genome of this ancient bug. We then isolate the biosynthetic gene clusters, drop them into a contemporary expression system, But what really is the exciting base of all of this is the authors have given us a roadmap complete with the waypoints or controls that we need to do in order to do further biosynthetic gene cluster analysis of these ancient genomes or even old genomes that we're finding from, you know, times gone past. And so, In this paper, we have witnessed the merging of metagenomics, genome mining, gene synthesis, and metabolic analyses with the field of ancient DNA research. And really, you go back to that YouTube video from Dr. DNA, and we've done it. The cartoon is now reality. 
And this paper really goes to show that if you are careful in what you do, you can learn a lot of things from schmutz. <laughs> a lot of things from schmutz. That's great. Yes. Yeah. So you- and by forming interdisciplinary teams. Oh, absolutely. Bring all this expertise in. So you could make natural products now from the Pleistocene and do drug, yes. do drug screens and look for inhibitors of whatever you want, right? Absolutely. And because these are unique compounds, right, these paleofurans, maybe you would get some things you've never had before, right? That right. no library on planet Earth could yeah. ever have cool. imagined. So the question is, yeah. can you scale this up? I mean, obviously, this is a very specific yeah. microbiome from yeah. yes. humans and Neanderthals from yeah. you know if you if you happen to have dirt that's i mean maybe core samples that are lower i mean it, it just kind of raises the question like where are you going to look for these and how are you going to look for these products because in a way this is the perfect thing right it's a limited group it's very specific you're only going to yeah. get a few species yeah. for the most part that aren't there already but yeah you can imagine there's a, i knew you were going to ask i know that. that's I the kind of question i'd ask, ask but i mean it's just like it's amazing, but also, yeah, this is, it might also go. Well, the answer is gold mines. The mm-hmm. answer is gold mines. You In these South African mines, we covered a paper on TWIM uh, before you joined us about going back in time through drilling and taking core samples and getting the core sample mud to effectively characterize the microbes from these um gold mine cores, as you go Mm. deeper into the earth, you're going back in time in sediment and you'll be able to pull out some of these. And so they have given us this roadmap to look at if it's real or if it's artifact. And I think all of the controls that Michelle brought up are, were so important to the rigor that was associated with this paper and why there were the, why they needed so many authors to effectively mm-hmm. uh, accomplish this task. I mean, this is not trivial work. No, I yeah. mean, and, and the other, you know, question I had, I mean, it's amazing actually to do this and to take these tiny sequences and align them like that to put this puzzle together. But my other question is thinking about the evolution of, uh, you know, green, of photosynthesis, the kind of classic uh, in the cyanos, right? Is this a cyano that reverted or do you think, I mean, because this is way too recent to be the evolution of. Oh, yeah. It's so way it's probably too recent a, to a bacteria that was somehow maybe by diet or, I mean, and I'm just trying to imagine like how this occurred. So it's like a chlorobium relative that. I, I think it probably came from fresh water. Uh, the Limacola is suggesting that this was probably in the water. And they just had such bad dental hygiene. They couldn't get it out. It's just an, yeah. They couldn't get it out. And it was an accident that these microbes got trapped in the calculus. Well, and 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 it's not just their dental hygiene, but of course they're drinking natural water. So of course they're going to have a lot more exposure since that's (laughs) gone through the treatment. Daily. (laughs) So I'd be surprised if it didn't have evidence of aquatic microbes. Also makes phrases maybe fish. We should be looking at fish teeth. Yeah. And besides the application, of course, it's it's the beauty of this is also just the um, understanding our evolutionary history as a people and also as microbes and me- metabolism. It's amazing. And to have to be able to do this uh, research, you need to have the training that someone like Alex Hubner, one of the first authors, has. Mm-hmm. He's currently a postdoc in the microbiome group in the Department of Archaeogenetics at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. And he um, admits he didn't get there in a a direct path. Um, He started out as an undergrad studying biotechnology, but he found a lot of the subjects that were on kind of applied methods, how do we scale up, how do we do this in a um, industrial setting, didn't really excite him. So when he Um, pursued a PhD, he started to look at um, diversity of microbes in the oral genome, for example, but also study um, evolution, malaria parasites, human population history, the effect of aging on human mitochondrial DNA. So he is a broad thinker, but was um, developing the tools that could allow him to ask those questions. 
So when he joined the lab of Christina Warner, um, he was then able to go back to studying microbes and how to reconstruct them from the ancient metagenomic DNA, which uh, Michael described. And so for the last couple of years, he's been really focusing on developing the methods that this group and others um, can use to reconstruct metagenomes from these tiny bits of DNA that can miraculously be covered from ancient samples. So he's really fortunate and and appreciates the collaboration between um, Christina's group and Pierre Stallworth, the other senior author, because it really allowed him to draw from all of his experience and his interests and to apply an evolutionary biology mindset on topics that definitely can advance biotechnology. He said one of his um, most exciting uh, points of this research was when they did the de novo assembly of all their available ancient DNA sequencing data. And initially, they were using um, samples that they had familiar with. They got it. They got a complete um, metagenome. But then they realized there, there's a whole other um, set of data that they could incorporate and expand their data set. And of course, this gave them a lot more opportunity to refine the data. So he said when he saw for the first time that they were able to reconstruct high-quality bacterial genomes from a 100,000-year-old Neanderthal dental sample, he was just like amazed that this actually, like their wildest dreams came true. (laughs) So from that, his advice to, to junior researchers is, um, you know, when you're in the university system, stay curious and don't be intimidated mm-hmm. but by the required courses. Just regard them as advice, not as a rule. <laughs> That's um, perfect. Follow your heart and really like tune in to what excites you um, because you'll have opportunities then to uh, pursue different research. And he says um, that exploration is almost always worth it in the end. And Alex has had a really um, impressive uh, research career. He's published a lot of um, high-profile papers in top journals like PNAS and Nature and um, others. And it really crosses between um, developing the um, tools to do the metagenomic analysis, but then also looking at evolution of, of populations, of human populations. So he's published on the Guam people in the Pacific and the Paleolithic humans in Europe and um, other um, ancient populations. So um, keep your eye on this fella. He's going to have uh, <laughs> a really interesting career and really expanding our knowledge of, of people and microbes and, and, and metabolism. And he does a lot of um, teaching also in um, courses to help people um, learn how to apply some of these methods. So um, applied phylogenetics is one course he's contributed to, and another on reproducible research and data management. So he's, he's contributing to our field in many ways. Cool. Keep your, keep your eyes open. That's it. I mean, it's so important. Not, and that advice, don't get intimidated, right? Because we do, mm-hmm. as we, when we're young and we start out, we're always intimidated by people who know so much more, but we shouldn't be. We should well, sometimes, Forget that. sometimes as young people, we know things they don't, too, or we're thinking in different ways. Right. And I think I always like For talking sure. to people outside my field directly. And there's this ongoing discussion about coursework and what's it for. I think the idea of that mm-hmm. is nice, but we're sort of also thinking about maybe coursework should be once, instead of before you join a lab, we should be teaching you communication and writing. And once you join a lab, then you should be able to choose the coursework you need. Mm-hmm. For what you're doing, right? Yeah. So this yeah. is like an ongoing grad discussion, I think, across the United States, at least. Yeah. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. And definitely as our science gets more interdisciplinary, because we've got such sophisticated tools now from different disciplines, um, uh, the more broad your training is, I think, the, the gives you um, more tools to work with and, and mm-hmm. fuel for your fire to follow exactly. your dreams. The more networking you can do and talking to other people, that's that's what you need because for interdisciplinary science, mm-hmm. I think. Well, just look what we talked about yeah. today on TWIM. We talked about organoids. We talked about bioinformatics and pushing the envelope with some of these algorithms like anti-smash and Mm-hmm. and pi and all of these others just to assemble genomes and then the heteroglyphous gene expression systems and comparing and contrasting uh looking at mutation frequencies in both cancer as well as in ancient dna i mean evolution <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> Microbiology mean, we really, is everything. We, yeah. we, we really covered Everywhere. the gamut today. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yep. So do not be limited by your coursework for sure. <laughs> but do do get uh, curious from it. Right? Yeah. Yep. You know, pay attention. And uh, I, like now at the end of the semester, all the students are emailing me and saying, oh, my gosh, I didn't know viruses were so cool. I learned so much. And that's the <laughs> best that's the best thing you could do, right? Is to open their eyes to something. And I, I give them an extra credit question on the exam. Tell me one thing you didn't know about viruses uh, that you learned taking this course. And I love, you know, what oh, they that's say. Great. I didn't know viruses could be good for you, or I didn't know there were so many viruses. I just thought there were a few. So I love wow. reading that. That's a lot of fun. Course Good for you, can Vincent. Be, can be eye opening if they're done right, right? Yes. And the first thing is you have to want to do it. <laughs> you know, if they, yes, if they force you to teach, it's not going to work. <laughs> That's a problem. You have to want to do it. All right, that is Twim two hundred eighty eight. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash Twim, and you can send questions or comments to Twim at microbe.tv. You can suggest the paper. Uh, like the first one today, suggested by uh, Paolo. Do it. Suggest papers. We're all ears. Please. And if you if you uh, like uh, what we do, if you appreciate our work, we'd love your financial support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute uh, for different ways that you can uh, help us out. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for such a stimulating afternoon. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And Petra Levin is at Washington University in St. Louis. Thanks, Petra. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.